too many of us are not living our dreams because we're living our fears. My fear was of trying something new, of going against what I was told to do, and doing something that I believed would work. I was two weeks into a six-week research project, and this was my world, the world of battery characteristics. <laughs> now, how many of you guys own or drive a hybrid electric or fully electric vehicle? All right, there are a couple of hands. Did you know that the number that appears on your dashboard that tells you how many miles you have left until you run out of charge is actually a calculated estimate? Well, pictured here is a typical graph of the characteristics of that battery in your hybrid. And here is the model that estimates those characteristics. Now, as you can tell, the model is fairly accurate up until a certain point. But then there's a very visible deviation. So the question we ended up asking ourselves was, could we create a model that compensates for this error and is more accurate across the spectrum? Now, before I tell you about what we made, I want to tell you a little bit about binary code. Binary code is the language of technology. It's the way your computer thinks. It's the way your computer processes. It's the way that your computer learns. And it's essentially just long strings of zero and one, which in our case, we refer to with the variable A. Now the model we ended up creating is called the nonlinear equivalent circuit model. Pictured above is a pretty typical electrical circuit, consisting of a current, a couple of resistors, a couple of capacitors, and a few voltages. This was the basis for our model, and each of these values played a role in calculating the voltage that we would ultimately plot using the voltage equation below. We had to use mathematical representations of these real-life components, and they are pictured here. Now this might look a little daunting, but the main point to notice is that each of these equations is a function of a certain A value. As I showed earlier, those A values are actually just strings of binary code. Well, we, we wrote a 4,000 line program in order to generate those strings of binary code. And my job was pretty simple. Take the A values, plug them into the intermediary equations, plug those resulting values into the final voltage equation, and graph the result. The only problem was that every time I would run the code, I would get 45 different sets of A values. Sounds fun, right? Even worse, because the code was so complex, every time I would run the code to get those 45 A-value sets, I'd actually get 45 slightly different A-value sets. So essentially, I had to find the optimal A-value in an infinite set. Now, I might have actually finished my research project on time if it hadn't been for Game of Thrones. <laughs> I'm at the part, you know, with this guy? Yeah. So between plugging in hundreds of zeros and ones and reading about the fate of the Lannister house, I chose the latter. And after two of the six weeks, I had completed one of the 12 batteries. Yeah, I was in trouble. And then I started to think, there has got to be a better way of going about this process. And I realized, I know nothing about binary code. But the computer does. I don't know the difference between a zero and one. But binary is the language of technology. So what if, instead of me manually plugging in these A values and trying to find the optimal set, I could have the computer generate and optimize those A values for me? The only problem was, I had to optimize these A values under multiple conditions. This, each particular A value, had to fit the resistor equation, the capacitor equation, and the voltage equation all at the same time. And that's where I got stuck. And then one day, I walk down into the lab, and my two lab mentors, Gustavo and Dr. Zhang, are having an intellectual conversation about the perfect superhero. Don't make fun of us, we're computer scientists. <laughs> so Gustavo says, Batman is a super, perfect superhero on behalf of his mobility and his quickness. But Dr. Zhang insists that Superman is the perfect superhero because of his super strength and large size. Now it seemed to me that the perfect superhero should have some combination of these traits. And then it hit me. Evolution. I could use evolution to optimize my A values under multiple conditions, kind of like superheroes. Now this is gonna get a little weird, but bear with me. Let's say I have two strings of binary code, A1 and A2. 
which I'll call Batman and Superman. Now, in theory, I could have Batman and Superman mate. Yeah. <laughs> I could have them mate and have hundreds and thousands of offspring. And then I could pick the best offspring and have them have hundreds of thousands of offspring. And I could repeat the process until essentially I have the perfect superhero. So, I scrapped everything and started working on my genetic algorithm. I even recreated the three sources of genetic diversity to ensure I got the perfect superhero from millions of possibilities. I recreated mutations by randomly swapping zeros and ones in the code, crossover by swapping entire bits of zeros and ones, and random placement by randomly moving the parental lines into the offspring. And what did I get? I got the perfect superhero, the string of binary code that gave you the best estimate of exactly how many miles you have left in your car. And how did it all work out? Well, let's take a look at the data. I didn't mean to use that line. <laughs> so, the orange line you see above is the old model, the linear model that's used in more than 10 million cars worldwide. The green line is the line that we're trying to match, the actual battery characteristics. And the light blue line is the model that we created, the nonlinear equivalent circuit model. Not bad, right? So, what did I learn from doing all this? Well, there are two main takeaways. And the first is the importance of taking a risk. Like the risk I took when I scrapped everything I had done in those two weeks and started working on that genetic algorithm. Now you might be wondering, what's that note up there? And what it is, is a list of some of the many plans I've ever come up with, no matter how ridiculous. And by the end of the day, I want you to take out your phone. And I want you to make a note, entitled it Entrepreneurial Plans. And then I want you to go about your life as usual. But every time you see something that could be more efficient, more convenient, or even just more awesome, I want you to write it down. Now I believe that changing the world isn't as difficult as you make it seem. In fact, it's as simple as asking yourself two questions. And the first is, what is my vision of a better world? And the second is, what can I contribute to make that vision a reality? And you may not know, but the answers are right there in your phone. So I want you to go back through that list of plans, and I want you to pick one and make it a reality. Start it up. Nowadays, there are startups and everything from technology to government. And I want you all to take a risk and create something that you believe in. Now, my second takeaway is the necessity of taking advantage of every opportunity. And I'm not just talking about the opportunity to learn to code or to conduct research, necessarily. I'm talking about taking advantage of every opportunity to get outside of your comfort zone. Every time you can, stretch yourself. Try new things, go new places, meet new people. I get the question of what a student in business school is doing in an engineering lab talking about evolution. And the answer I like to give them is, I have no idea. <laughs> the truth is, I saw an opportunity to stretch myself way beyond anything I knew. And I never would have finished my project if it hadn't been for evolution, biology, a topic seemingly totally unrelated. And that's why I refuse to be a business student, only a business. I refuse to put on these blinders that block me off from new knowledge and new opportunities. And I encourage you all to do the same. Because these labels of humanities and science and business, they're man-made. But the world doesn't exist in these neat little compartments. And neither should we. The issues of today in the globalized world we live in are interdisciplinary. And you'll need all your knowledge from everywhere to be able to solve them. The vision of solar power as the predominant source of energy in the world will require technology for development, business for marketing, economics for establishment, humanities for understanding the cultural barriers, and so much more. And that knowledge without borders is crucial for solving not only the issues of today, but the issues of tomorrow. And this isn't so much a suggestion as it is a plea. The world needs us all generations of thinkers, to go places we've never been, places far away from our comfort zone, places where the magic happens. Too many of us are not living our dreams because we're living our fears. Go take a risk. Go take advantage of everything the world has to offer. Start something worth talking about. Thank you.